We ended at chapter two and verse two last time, but I want to make sure that we put it in its context because if you don't, you make a pretext and make it say something it doesn't say. John is dealing with Christian people who are supposed to be a people of love. And it is hard to love people who have left you. It is hard to love people who have fallen away. It is hard to love people who don't think they've done anything wrong, by the way, and in turn, turn around and have condemned you for thinking that they have done something wrong or they have left or they have done uh, something that uh, shouldn't have, shouldn't have uh, done it. I mean, it, to them, it, it's not anything at all. Gnosticism has taken over the first century church. It is the idea that the more you know, the better off you are. There's nothing wrong with knowing things. In fact, I, I kind of like to know things. I kind of like to be a little smarter than the average bear boo-boo, but I don't try to do that very, I try to be arrogant about it. That's not the problem here. John doesn't say that you should know anything or should know something. Problem is, is that since the Gnostics got this idea in their head or got this idea that all flesh is inherently evil, then there's no way Jesus could be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the majority of people were teaching that you are that all flesh is inherently evil. There was a minority group of people that were teaching that there's no way the Son of God, that is the deity Jesus, the Christ, could be anywhere close to the human Jesus. And so th those two didn't exist in the Gnostic's mind. Well, you and I know better. In fact, Hebrews 2.18 says there's no way we could be saved without him becoming a human being first. Galatians 4.4, 4, he came at the right time to redeem those under the law, born under the law, born of a woman, born under the curse of the law. Well, there was some, there was a group of centrists who at least kind of got close. They turned around and they said, well, there's, hey, there's just no way that we could really hold to the, to both camps there that he had to be who he claimed to be, but it was just temporary. The only time that he ever was deity and human together was when he was baptized in Matthew chapter 3, and then up until he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because you see, he, he did these incredible things. Did he raise anybody from the dead? Even the centrists would say, yeah, he did. That he, you just touched him and people would be healed. How about the woman who had the flow of blood for 12 years? That's just one example. And so, yeah, all of that was right. You Christian people were right. But when... He was in the garden, and he prayed those three times. Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That is when God heard his prayer. That is when God acted on his prayer. Took the deity Jesus, took the Christ out of Jesus, took him back to heaven, and the man that you Christian people claim died was just a human being. That he deserved what he got. That he deserved more than he got. He got off scot-free in their eyes, just like most people. That's what Isaiah 53 said about us before we came to our senses. That actually, we thought Jesus got off light compared to what happened to him. And that... When the man that you people claim is Jesus the Christ was not Jesus the Christ. He was just Jesus. And so this business 
this idea that that Jesus that that one man died for the entire world that's just ridiculous that's just a ridiculous story that is just so crazy and so bizarre that one man would die for the world so how are you going to know you're approved of God how much smarter you are how much more do you know than somebody else and that's why some preachers still go around today and i'm not talking about church of christ preachers but i do know of some preachers across the board that think they're smarter than you are and the reason is because they're the preacher doesn't make any sense to me either i'm more in jeff jenkins camp i told some of you about this whenever he he lost his wife a few years ago and and she made him promise that every year she he'd go to the doctor. Well, he kept going to the doctor and every year, and the doctor would say, you're fine. Well, his doctor retired, and so he he's kind of scrambling around to find one. He was asking some brethren there at Louisville. And so finally, the so they said, well, this one doctor is excellent, and he, he was. He said, man, he, he's just outstanding. And yet he noticed Jeff's age, and he said, have you ever had a stress test? And he said, Doc, I've been preaching the gospel for 50 years. I stress out in it every day. <laughs> no, 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 no. And he said, have you ever had a stress test? He said, I knew what it was. He says, and the next time, he, if he ever does it again, I'm going to go to sleep. What they do is they take a pin prick, pin, pin hole right here, and they go in to your heart. And he said, everything was going great and fine until the doctor said, give me a stem. Give me another stem. Give me another stem. He said, I wanted to ask the doctor, can you just go ahead and knock me out? He put five stents in Jeff's heart. And he said, but I didn't know how bad I felt until I, <laughs> until I started. And he said, but the next time I'm going to tell the doctor if he gets to do that again, he's going to put me to sleep. Well, the, the, this idea that you are smarter than everybody else, that you're, you have more knowledge, you're closer to God, it is so prevalent because I still have people that will tell me, oh, you're a preacher? Well, you're closer to God than I am. Since when? I'm not any closer to God than anybody else. And so John wants to reassure the church, brethren, that just because the majority of people bought into this baloney, and that's what it is, this false doctrine does not mean that they, the ones that have stayed behind, are losing their salvation. And we looked at last week, what do people do with sin? Well, first of all, some people just don't, don't even recognize there's a thing called sin. I know of some Christians that have told me that, Dwayne, you sin and you're going to hell, but I don't sin because I'm a Christian. Now, there is a sin that's leading to death, which John addresses in this book, and there's one that's not leading to death. The one not leading to death is when you're in Christ and you and you can repent of it. The one that you're not in Christ is the one you can't ever repent of it because you have no you have no legal bounds, you have no grace bounds to ask God to forgive you. And that's, that we'll get to that later. But John says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. If we say we have no sin, verse 10, down in chapter 1, we make God out to be a liar. And his word's not in us. And I'm going to repeat what I said last week, and that is, anybody want to make God out to be a liar? Not me. But if we walk in the light, verse 7, you see, there's people that recognize there is a thing called sin, and they do sin. 
But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I used to misread that. I thought it would say would cleanse. No, cleanses. Because the blood of Christ is here. And then verse 10 is so, so easy to read, but hard to accept. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, wait a minute. You're just telling me if I confess to it, God will forgive. He not only will forgive, he's right to forgive. And he's not only right to forgive, he's also right to clean us up. Now, how is he going to do that? Chapter 2, verse 1. And that's where we're going to start tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time tonight. Thank you so much for the moisture you've chosen to give us today. And Father, we we sometimes get excited about the speed in which it comes and and the, the hail that goes with it sometimes. But Father, we, we sure need it. And Father, we thank you that you chose to give it to us. Father, we pray for many people that need our prayers tonight, for Sandra Jones's great grandbaby and for Ron Hickman, he's doing better, and we're thankful for that. And and we pray for Rita and for for um, Debbie and fathers for so many others that need our prayers. We lift them up to you, knowing you'll take care of them as you see fit. Please bless us tonight as we study. And may we be reminded how great it is to be a Christian. It is in and through the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. See, it's so easy for us to be a people who just, when things are going great, man, I'm telling you what, God's wonderful. God's awesome. And we should be joyous in God. But how about the times when it's tough? How about the times when it's kind of rough? When you have this major jolt, if you will, when you have this major issue of people leaving the lord's church and falling for a false doctrine it is hard for me to live by the principle you can't live people's life for them and the reason is because i love them so much i have school kids that they just break my heart all the time they think it's funny that they don't do work it's it's hurting them but what do you got to do? You've got to let them learn. And sometimes that learning is a little painful. <laughs> Especially when you get to the end of the nine weeks. Of, and I kept telling the kids last year, judgment day. Judgment day. Well, they weren't paying any attention until they got their report cards. <gasps> what, what do you mean I got a, what do you mean I got an F? Did you see how much you turned in? Does that matter? I, they're just killing themselves, so to speak. And I know they're kids. And I'm not trying to be over dramatic. It's just to illustrate my point. You see, John says what we need is a dose or we need a remedy that if we sin, and John's word would have been better when we sin, in my opinion, we first of all have been told that we don't have to. I've heard people and Christian people say, oh, well, you know what? There's no choice. I, I, I've got to sin. Really? Now, don't misunderstand me. Nobody's perfect. Do we sin? Uh-huh. Are we proud of it? No. And what breaks my heart is to watch Christian people do like my school kid. Well, you know, I, Dwayne, I, I know. I know I'm supposed to be at church. and Dwayne, I know I'm supposed to, to be there and, and everything, but you know how hard it is for me to get to the building? 
I always love to tell them, yeah, it's hard for me to get to the building too. And then they'll ask me, how, how far do you live from the building? 35 feet. But do you know that 35 feet is just as tough as it is for somebody that lives 35 miles away sometimes? I hurt. I ache. I didn't sleep well last night. And I can make excuses with the best of them. But what does is, what is John remind us of? If anyone sins, we have a defense attorney. The defense attorney, it's the only place in the New Testament where you see this, this word advocate. And it might surprise you who the prosecutor is. First time I noticed who the prosecutor was, I went, there is no way he can be a prosecutor. Well, we know who the judge is. Pretend you're in a courtroom. You know who the judge is? That's God. You know who the prosecutor is? The devil. The devil. Now, does he tell the truth? <laughs> he can't tell the truth. But have you ever had somebody say something bad about you? Have you ever said somebody say a lie about you? Does it hurt? Does it stain your reputation a little bit? Uh huh. And boy, I'll tell you, he's got books and books and books and books. If, if, we could take all the books in and hold it in this auditorium of the notebooks of the charges he could bring against us. And who's the defense attorney? Jesus. Who says, I died for him. And 100% is Jesus' success rate. He's the only attorney that's got it. F. Lee Bailey doesn't have it. There was an attorney back in Alta, Oklahoma that he could charge more than anybody because he never lost a case in all his years of practicing law. Don't ask me how. But only the wealthy could afford him. Anybody can afford Jesus who those who give their lives to him. And when Jesus says, I died for that person, put it on my account, not guilty. Want proof of that? Go back to Zechariah chapter 3 sometimes. Yeah, you won't find it in the exact format I was describing. But you've got Zechariah and he sees a vision. There is the Joshua, the son of Shealtiel, the high priest. And he's filthy. And who's standing right there to oppose him? Satan. And before Satan can get one word out of his mouth, the Lord rebuke you, the Lord rebuke you. And he says, and the the angel says, clean him up. Zechariah says, put a clean turban on his head. He does. Now, what was the point of all of that? So that Zechariah could take up some space in the Bible? No. Israel was represented by Joshua, not the not the second leader different man he's filthy filthy in god's eyes but god took away the filth and when god took away the filth god reminded israel you're not going to do what you've been doing before now did it hold did it work no unfortunately no 430 years from the day Abraham received the promise to the time they left Egypt and given another 430 years and the entire 12 tribes of Israel were no more. Because a new kingdom came into, pow into power. And that's Jesus. So now what do people do with sin? Well, everyone needs to turn to God. Now, can you know whether or not you have eternal life. Now, the question comes up with some people. I never have thought about it much. I like the song Tony Arata wrote that Garth Brooks made famous, The Dance. 
And he's right. Our lives are better left to chance. I could have missed the pain, but I'd have to miss the dance. But spiritually, you don't have to miss the dance. And spiritually, you don't have to not know. Because 1 John 5.13 is also going to back this up. We can know we have eternal life. We can know whether we're in Christ. Now, I want to look at two passages here tonight. And let's go backwards here. From first John. Let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter one. We don't like to, I mean, we kind of like it from the Christian perspective to talk about Second Thessalonians chapter one. We don't like it from the non-Christian perspective because nobody likes to talk about hell. Nobody talks likes to talk about punishment. I mean, we we'd like to stay at first John and just talk about how things are great and wonderful. But look at first John one verse seven. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his flame, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel. I, I got it backwards intentionally, so don't panic. We're real good at that one. You don't obey the gospel? You have rejected Jesus. You don't do what he says. You have simply said, I don't want any part of the gospel. But how about that first one? On those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Back up to John chapter 17. Same author. He's quoting Jesus. John 17, verse 3, it said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Now, it is just as important to know God as it is to obey God. You can tell quickly, without sounding like I'm holier than thou, I can tell quickly when somebody doesn't know God. I almost had something thrown at me, and I hadn't been here too many Sundays when I said cleanliness is next to godliness is not in the Bible. An idle mind is the devil's workshop is not in the Bible. They kind of accepted that until I turned around and said, but I have escaped by the skin of my teeth is, and that individual almost threw something at me. Come to find out, I hadn't been a Christian very long, thankfully. And, and another person said, well, it ought to be. They ought to be in the Bible. I get it. I heard that those two phrases most of my life. But Job 19.20 is where you find the reference, I've escaped by the skin of my teeth. You know, there's a lot of things in Job you'll read that if scientists had read, they'd have, they'd have figured out a long time ago. <laughs> but I know God. We used to uh, hang out with some friends before they moved off, and we'd we'd usually meet at Pizza Hut. And Adele would just roll her eyes at me. Would y'all believe she'd do that when I would say to her, and we'd order breadsticks? You're not allowed to have the sauce. You're not allowed to have the tomato sauce. I forbid you from having the tomato sauce. Now she'd roll her eyes at me. But my friends would look at me and go, who do you think you are? How dare you tell your wife that she cannot have the sauce? And of course, she'd give it away. I don't like the sauce. But I know her. 
Floyd used to talk about Joanne, and he said if she wanted to go to McDonald's, she's got to be awful, awful hungry, especially if it's a Big Mac. She's got to be hungry. Because the one place she never wanted to eat was McDonald's. <laughs> I know God. I know what he's going to do. I used to tell friends of mine, I know what my dad's going to do if I don't go out that field and plow. Cruel man. Miss him every day. But I knew what my dad was going to do. Same principle, folks. Because the Gnostics said, it doesn't matter if you know God or not. It is God who has to know you. It's God who has to know you. And if God knows you, then he knows how much you can handle. And so if you know more, it, it almost reminds you today of, of Albert Einstein would be closer to God than Dwayne Springer. One guy I read yesterday had an IQ of 300. See, God, God blessed him more, that, therefore he's a, he's a better individual. No. True knowledge. True knowledge is in knowing God. Doesn't matter how much you know or you don't know, as far as and if you know, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence tonight. If it sounded like I'm doing that, please don't take it that way because you're more intelligent than I am. But I'm just telling you, you can't measure, you can't do physical things to figure out spiritual things. That is why the book of Revelation is so hard for us to understand. Because what John's doing is, is he's trying to describe spiritual things with physical things, and that's just like putting gas or water in a gas tank. Does it work? No. And I'm so proud of the way we've matured. You see, at one time, brethren thought there were 65 books inspired of the Bible. Oh, they'd get on my case if I said that. No, there's 66. There's 39 Old Testament, 27 New. But you know which book they loved to avoid when I was growing up? Book of Revelation. Because if it wasn't in a John T. Hines commentary or a Guy in Woods commentary, then it's got to be wrong. Those are human beings, people, and we're talking gospel advocate here. But I had people when I was growing up tell me, well, I didn't find that in the Gospel Advocate commentary, so it's got to be wrong. That's a human human publication. And yes, we don't understand a lot of things about the book of Revelation because it wasn't written for us. It was written in Jewish apocalyptic language. So what do you know? True knowledge is in knowing him. And true knowledge says love True knowledge defines love here. Now, can you be smart? Can you be classified as a genius and love people? Absolutely. But I do know in dealing with people, as long as I've dealt with people, the smarter you are, the harder it is to love sometimes for some people. Have you ever heard of some adults around kids i just get so irritated some adults i shouldn't probably say this but i'm going to anyway and what they do is they act they try to get that kid to act like they're 80 years old that kid's not going to act like they're 80 years old brie was standing back there right at about the last pew one time and she was just bouncing around and bouncing around and we and nobody was upset about it but but I said, you know what? I would just love to plug into her for five minutes. And and my friend, one of my Christian brothers said, no, you blow a circuit. It's true. How in the world does this work? I don't know. And Christopher is now, he he just blows and goes. And somebody said one time, said, said uh, man, it's amazing how thin he stays. And we all look at him and said, have you ever seen him move? He doesn't sit down for anything. And when he does, he's usually concentrating on something. We all chalk it up to ADHD, but I don't know about that. 
He's just 15 years old. He'll be 16 Monday, by the way. Just thought I would make you feel old. <clears throat> but true knowledge is actually in the love of God. Go back to chapter 2, verse 3. By this we know we know him. You see, you, you thought it was two separate things, didn't you? I did. For a long time, I thought it was two separate things. What, by this we know we know him by doing what, folks? Keeping his commandments. Oh, I'm telling you what, that's the toughest thing for anybody to do, right? John says it isn't. Then why do we find it so difficult sometimes? Well, I know why it's difficult for me sometimes to listen to what God says. You're looking at him. You're looking at him. And I have learned the hard way and learned over and over again that Satan will do anything he can. Use anybody he's got in his repertoire to get me off my game. And last year he did an awesome job at his job. I almost lost it a few times. Thankfully, and praise God, I didn't. Didn't mean I didn't want to. We know Christ by following his commands. And did not Jesus say in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. They're not hard to follow. Look at verse 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments, He's okay with God. What what John say he was? He's a liar. John 8, 44 says Satan is the father of whom? Liars. The spiritual father of all liars is the devil. And the truth is not in him. Well, I'm sure that's right. I mean, just seeing that, of course, obviously, he's inspired of the Holy Spirit. That's not what I mean by my comment. But have you ever? I mean, he's not a member of the church, but he remind this, what John's describing here reminds me of a fellow over at Silver. And when I'd see him, you know, he, I didn't know him from Adam very much, and he found out I was a preacher, and so he... He'd always talk to me, and he'd tell me a joke, a good, clean, funny joke. But when I tried to tell him a joke, guess what? I couldn't tell him a joke because I never was serious. And I'd go, why is it you get to tell me a joke, but I don't get to tell you one? Because we need to get serious about things, Dwayne. What he was in indicating was that I'm going to hell. Took me a while to figure out. And see, the truth's not in it. Because he would go and he would get that arrogant tone, just like these Gnostics would. You see, I know more. Uh, and if you've ever studied with, a, and I love him to death, don't get me wrong, but I had a Jehovah's Witness come by one day, and and uh, and he and I don't know if you know their mo, but their mo is this: they go by twos. There's nothing wrong with that. I got condemned for suggesting that one time at church that we go out and support each other. But five minutes, if if you're there five, if they're at your house more than five minutes, then the rescuer comes. And so the young man walked up and I opened the door and he said, if you died today, would you know you have eternal life? And he wasn't ready for my answer. I'd say yes. And so he, I mean, that wasn't the script. And so he, he's trying his best to redirect me to say no. And I, like I said, I don't, I don't hate them. I don't despise them. 
but his rescuer came in five minutes and we had a 45 minute discussion as to whether or not this world will be destroyed. I see what they teach is that the inside is the only thing that's going to be destroyed, but God's going to recreate it. And he's only going to put fig trees in it. You know, Jesus talked about the fig tree and how it withered. And so we're going to live off the fig trees of the world for a thousand years. And when I shared with him 2 Peter 3, and I tried to show him in the New King James Version, he says, I don't read that version. And that's true. But what he wasn't prepared for was as I took his watchtower translation, which he reluctantly let me borrow. You ever seen anybody's veins in their head go up? And I showed it to him. And he goes to Hurley a couple of days later, and he tells a Christian brother, I don't want to go to heaven. This is heaven to me. Broke his heart, broke my heart. And the reason is, is because he's not walking in Christ. He's not doing what God said to do. And the truth's not in him. Now, continue down to verse 5. Whoever keeps his word... Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. And here's here's the deception part, by the way. Lest you think I'm trying to sound like I'm better than everybody else, which I'm not. If you can be deceived, I can be deceived. And that's what Satan loves. He can't stand it when somebody won't get in this book. And I've had people tell me, oh, I don't, I don't read the Bible. But God loves me. How do you know God loves you? How do you even know there's a God if you don't have this book? That's what I asked them. And they go, well, I just feel like it. Well, I feel like God hates me because I'm in pain a lot of times. And I feel better, by the way, praise God. And I don't feel like God hates me. But, but if I'm using that standard and the Gnostic standard, God really hates me because, you see, I'm poor and I, I I don't have all these cars out here in the parking lot and I don't I don't have all this money and I and you guys need to you guys need to get my airplane. You guys are way behind. That sixty five million dollar jet needs to be bought for me. Okay. You think I'm? There's a, there's a couple of denominational preachers that are in a competition to see who can have the most jets. One of them has two. $65 million. Mercy. And here's what is so heart-wrenching is there are people that believe that they are teaching the truth. Okay, let me ask you a question. Let me just give you one example real quick because I'm running out of time and I know it. Jesus said, John 3, no man has ever seen, no, excuse me, no man has ever ascended to, the, to heaven except the one who descended. He's talking about himself. About 10 to 20 years, no, about 25 years ago, one of these denominational preachers, one of these TV preachers said he went to heaven. That he saw Abraham. You know what Abraham looks like, he says? You remember the old stories that, I don't know if you do, but I always was told God or Abraham, or uh, they were talking about God. He's got long, white hair, and he steps on it most of the time because this is the way he walks. And he said Abraham had this long, flowing hair all the way down and, and he took me around for three days and I saw God what did Jesus say if you what did the Bible say no man's ever seen who God well how do you explain Moses when he said he saw God face to face he saw Jesus because what did Jesus say in John 14 if you've seen me you've seen whom you've seen the father and everything this guy described, 
Jesus says couldn't happen. Now, I want to ask you a question. Because I like the way this guy talks sometimes and some of the funny jokes he tells. Which one do you think's right? Jesus or the TV preacher? Jesus is right. And the neatest thing about what John is going to tell us tonight is what I've heard members of the church tell me. I don't need to hear this. You know, I don't know why I showed up tonight. Now, you needed to hear it. You needed to hear it. You needed to hear it back there, but I didn't need to hear it. I went, I've been a Christian for 43 years. I still need to hear this. <laughs> and John says, I'm going to tell you something. You don't need to know new. Now, why is that? Because John 13, 34, 60 years before this, before this book was written, who said a new commandment I give you? that you love one another. Anybody want to help me out with that? Jesus sold it. And he says, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing new that I'm going to teach you tonight. So why in the world, John, why did you write this book? He says, because you need to be reminded. I did an experiment a few years ago. When I was at San Lorenzo, and incidentally, and then at those kids I had, I had when I got to the high school. And I taught them the old Tommy Two Tone song. Eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine, nine, eight. Six seven five three zero nine eight six seven five three zero nine eight six seven five three zero nine. Four years later, guess what they're telling me when they walk in my door? Eight six seven five three zero. I said, "You guys remember that?" And they said, "Like it was yesterday." It, did it really mean that much? No, not really. Now, I will tell you, I taught them the other one, and unfortunately, they remember that one more than they did the Tommy Tutor. But anyhow, I'll digress in that. You want to know what that is later, I'll tell you. But John says, I'm not going to teach you anything new. And the reason is, what are we, who, who are we walking in? We're walking in God, right? Go to chapter 4 of this book, of 1 John. Go to chapter 4 and go to verse 7 and 8. And tell me what are the descriptor John gives of God. God is, is who? 1 John 4, 7 and 8. He's love. So is he going to tell you anything new? No. In fact, he's going to turn around and remind you of something. And this is something that we don't like to talk about. And I can tell you, I, I cherish the experience now. But at the time, it wasn't a very pleasant experience. But how would you like it if a Christian brother hated you and every time he had the chance, walk up to you out of nowhere and go wrath on you, go to hell. How would you love that? About where Adele's sitting is where he'd be sitting, and he'd get mad about something. And the reason he thought he could do it is he misread Romans 13. When he read the word minister, he was the only preacher here. I wasn't. Just tore things up terribly. But he forgot something. We're supposed to walk in love. If you hate your brother, and he's going to say this in chapter 3, verse 15, you're not walking in God. In fact, what does he say in chapter 3, verse 15? You're a murderer. 
You're a murderer. So members of the church always get along, don't they? I can't even say it hardly without cringing. No, I just told you an example. Two prominent members of the Lord's church, two prominent preachers for 20 years were fighting about something. And instead of doing it the biblical way, what they do? They just kept on and kept on and kept on. Finally, one of them said, one of them found out that the other one was sick and almost dying. And he says, I got to do this right. He went over there. And, and the, the brother that he thought was offended or the brother that offended him, they talk. They have a, about a three or four hour meeting and they're laughing and cutting up and they looked at each other and said, I don't even know what we were fighting about. But almost forfeited their souls because they wouldn't work it out. John says, if you hate a brother, you're not walking in God. Now, does that mean you have to embrace all kinds of false doctrine and false teaching? Get on? No. <laughs> There are some people that misunderstand John here when it says you can't even let them in the house. If you let a Jehovah's Witness in the house, you let somebody that doesn't agree with the truth in the house, you're going to hell. That's not what John taught. John says if you agree with them and go off in their persuasion. No. You see, you either walk right or you stumble. You either walk right or you stumble by either walking in the light or not. I don't cherish, I, I didn't cherish at the time, but I still cherish trying to walk out of this building with the lights off. And this is before you had the phones that had the flashlights on. You know how many knees I've I've run into? <laughs> and they don't give, by the way. There's some people that won't even open the book and won't even go in the light. And it doesn't matter your maturity level. And he's going to talk about three different people. He's going to talk about little children. And the reason is he's kind of like a grandpa. He's the last pioneer of, Christ, of the Christian life to these people. That is, he's the last of the 12 apostles. He's not the last Christian. That isn't what I said. And so he calls them little children. And then he calls them young men. And then he calls them, look at verse 14. Fathers. But it doesn't matter your maturity level. What you need to know is our sins are forgiven. Did that say will be forgiven? Yes, no. No, they are forgiven. That is so hard for me to wrap my head around because I know what I did. I know how guilty I've been. Number two, you've known him who's from the beginning. No, you weren't in the beginning. I asked a kid today, "Are you? were you named after Thomas Jefferson? And he said, no. I said, then you're a very, 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 very old man. Now, if you don't understand that, think about that later. You're not from the beginning, but God is. And you've known him. And thirdly, you've overcome the wicked one. Did it say you will overcome the wicked one? That's what I got in my head. Well, what does Romans 8, 37 teach? We've been made more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so what is the problem? What, what is this whole mechanism that Satan uses to try to get us off track? He tries to get us to love the world. Look at verse 15. He tries his best to get us to love the world. And there are things I got, I'm going to be honest with you tonight. There's some things I like in this world. I joke with Adele that I'm going to go buy that 22 Ford pickup that somebody bought the other day. And you know the reaction I get. And if you don't, it's not very nice. I don't want that F-22. I don't want that 22 model. I like my pickup. I like Adele's car. 
You know what? You know what the kids tell me? Not my kids, personal kids, but the school kids. You need to get a new one. Have you seen what those things cost? I still love the story. Of my aunt asked Jim Click Chevrolet, the the dad to the one in Tucson, and he said, "How much? This is a '73 Chevy pickup." And she said, "How much do you want for this?" And Jim Click goes, $3,250. She goes, man, they want a lot for pickups these days. I'm not going to ask you what you pay for yours, sir. But I know it's more than $3,250. There's some other things that I like in this old world. That That's not a problem. I don't want you going home thinking for a minute you can't have that and you shouldn't do that. Because I grew up with that mentality. I, I grew up being told that if you had money, you were a sinner. That's not what the Bible taught. It's when you love those things and you love idols more than you love God. Don't love the world. Neither the things that are in the world. And the kids look at me, school kids, and I say, do you know what, by the way, um, I should back up. Do you know what those things? Headphones that go over the ears cost anywhere between two hundred and four hundred dollars, and I'm talking about the brand names. When I was in high school, the Walkman was the one that came out, but all we could afford was the ones that went over the ears, and those were for nerds. Nerds. I had two kids that are wearing them over the years, and and it's just unreal. I asked a, a college student, "How much did you pay for the bat? How much did you pay for them?" He said, two twenty-five. I went, Ooh. "You see, I like the ones that go in your ears because those were for the cool kids when I was in school." It's almost backwards, folks. What am I getting at? What I'm getting at is all that's in the world comes in three categories. Number one, lust of the flesh. What makes me feel good? If that means I'm going to insult you, hurt your feelings, then fine, I'll do it. The lust of the eyes. Oh, I like that. I like what I see. I like what I see. And the pride of life, or the American standard calls it the vain word of life. Now, John says, Here's the problem with that. And guess what? Vince Gill put it to a song a few years ago. Everybody's waiting for the next big thing. You remember when Al Gore made an idiot of himself by saying he invented the internet when he was running for president in the year 2000? You remember when Howard Dean, the chairman of the Democratic National Party, was running for president in 2004? And he started screaming and hollering like a rock performer. And his ratings just went. Phew. When they told me a few years ago that the one thing that kids would never, ever use was email, I thought they were crazy. I had to teach high schoolers how to email. And they couldn't get it. And one of them went home and had had her mother go through it again. And she turned around and she said, Mister, that's the easiest thing I've ever. I said, you know what that email is? It's a text. That's all it is. And now I'm texting. And, and all these other things. And technology lasts six months. I was watching a program one day back in the 80s. And he says, you can, you can, you can count on that technology being two years. And I was snickering because now it's six months. It changes all the time. Sin does the same thing, folks. It's changing all the time, but it's still sin, isn't it? When I was growing up, marijuana was bad for you. Now marijuana is okay. When I was growing up, alcohol was bad for you. Alcohol is okay. 
because you see the government taxes it and they regulate it. And I'm thinking the next one is going to be heroin. You know why? Because the only reason marijuana and alcohol are taxed and regulated is because the government can't control it. And they can't control heroin. Whatever the next big thing, now fentanyl. Because you can't get meth very well. Fentanyl. All these things. Isn't it funny how the Bible just seems to be more and more relevant as we speak? John says, don't love the things that are in the world. It's not that you can't have them. Who controls you? Who controls you? What controls you? And how does it control you? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time tonight. We pray we use the time wisely. And Father, we just thank you for the privilege we have of being in each other's company. And Father, as we go away from here tonight, may we be safe and be protected and in your care. Please forgive us of our sins. Thank you so much for the one who loved us. Thank you for the one who still loves us today. And Father, the one we get to know. And one day, we'll get to see you just as you are. Father, thank you for this privilege of which angels look in and would love to have, but can't have. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. I thank y'all for being here tonight.